few days ago, Anti-Bullshit Man uh, uploaded a really interesting video, and it's another sort of fascination of mine. Uh, this idea of do the people at the top of our society, whoever, however you might define the top, I guess, um, do they believe in this system that they've created, or that they run, or that they dominate, or that they excel in, or whatever? Um, this comes up a lot in, say, things like the Catholic Church, where, okay, you have a large body of people who presumably, um, if not necessarily swallow whole, the idea the idea is peddled by the Catholic Church, but they at least go along with it, um, and they defer to the people who tell them what reality is, or what right and wrong is, and this sort of thing. And, which of course begs the question, um, do the people at the top uh, believe it? Um, do the people at the top of the heap actually consciously create an illusion for their own selfish purposes, or, uh, as we saw, say, in the old 1960s show, The Prisoner, do the people perhaps at the top honestly believe, or at least in some, t some ways and at some times, honestly believe that what they're doing is for the best of society? Um, goes all the way back to Plato's cave versus Plato's republic. Uh, Plato said that uh, we all live, or not all of us, but almost all of us live in something of a magic theater where we're watching things that are being consciously um, dangled before our eyes to get us to think a certain way or to believe certain things. Um, and he posits the view that, uh, I guess, in the Republic, that the best thing to do is to make sure that the people who are the puppet masters, I guess we'd call it, or at least the people operating the movie camera behind their heads that are um, flashing the images on the, on the screen, at least those people are properly trained and that they know what is good for everybody. Um, now, there's, there's a third option there between it's a conspiracy aimed at screwing everybody else or preying upon everybody else versus the idea that there are people who, at least as they understand the terms uh, or understand the whole issue, they want to do this for good reasons, i.e. it is a conspiracy, it's either a bad or a good conspiracy. Well, there's the third one, and that's the autopilot thing where, you know, see, again, going back to the Catholic Church, where um, it was originally cooked up as an idea to sort of um, legitimize the central government of the ancient Roman Empire, and when the Roman Empire crumbled, the Catholic Church had such a fundamental place in society that it continued on long after people had ceased to actually believe in the Roman Empire. It's with us to this day. Uh, it, uh, it's still a powerful thing and a powerful set of ideas that, you know, it's part of the human experience. It's not it's not even a conspiracy anymore. It's just, it's got a, its very existence has got its own momentum behind it. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's what the Catholic Church is. I, I have much more hostile and negative view of the Catholic Church than to believe that it's just some, some sort of mechanism that was set in place as more or less a conspiracy, or at least a propaganda machine um, that has outlived its usefulness, but its sort of existence is now guaranteed by its own momentum. Uh, that's three options. We have... A good conspiracy, a bad conspiracy, or a conspiracy that just is no longer serving its original purpose, but is so effective that it just keeps going. Um, that's an interesting question. Now, the ones that I like to actually deal with are the ideas of whether or not it's, or I think most people like to, whether or not the... <coughs> Sorry, if our civilization is a conspiracy, if consumer capitalism is some sort of idea to dupe us all, or liberal democracy, or the internet, or the mass media, or TV, or uh, anything, is just uh, is actually a negative, uh, a frightening conspiracy. Um, you know the way that say um, um, a lot of sort of we would broadly call them, I guess, left wing. Uh, views of society would say it's all just a pile of garbage peddled to us by people at the top who are actually benefiting from that conspiracy. And they're, they're benefiting in a way that most of us would agree that they are benefiting. Uh, in other words, let's say that I'm, um, I'm a multi-gazillionaire and I own a media empire or a, <laughs> a real estate empire. <laughs> um, 
And I'm duping everybody, okay, with my advertising, and, and I'm playing with people as though they're pieces on a chess board, and I'm um, basically manipulating the entire society, and I'm making huge amounts of money. I've got, uh, as Black Adder said, more women than my tongue can cope with. I've got tons of power. I have uh, tons of comforts and luxuries and all this sort of thing. And the way that I guarantee all of that is the way that I manipulate society to funnel all of this goodness towards myself, all of the value that is in society towards myself. Incidentally, a lot of people see the, um, a lot of anti-Semites actually seem to feel the same way. Um, that, you know, that Jewish people actually have managed to so ensconce themselves into society that all the good things in society head their way. Um, again, you know, I'm inclined to listen to people when they diss the Catholic Church in that way, but the same logic when applied to, say, the Jewish community kind of puts it into starker contrast and saying, be careful when you start scapegoating people like that. It's just a caution. Um, sorry, noise in the background there. That's my son. Um, but what, what I'm... What I got into with Andy Bullshit Man, I don't know if he's going to respond to me or not, but is that accurate? Is it accurate to say that, say, the the people at the top of uh, the cons the conspiracy that is society, let's assuming it is, it, this is assuming that it is a conspiracy, but let's say that, that society is a conspiracy and that the people at the top of it um, are arranging society as something of a an olive press. In other words, they take all the rest of us, put us in their olive press, squeeze all the goodness out of us, and they get all the oil, and uh, we're just we're just the, the dregs that are left over. And that's what's good for us. Is it really a benefit to them to be at the top? I would argue that no, it isn't, because the, the very things that, um, that these people say are good are the ones that they use to bribe us with, that they only give themselves. In other words, consumer capitalism offers us all a very small piece of the pie in return for everybody, everybody who's at the top getting a massive piece of the pie. All that there is is a pie. It's, and it's all the same stuff that's being fed out to everybody. Do the people at the top truly benefit uh, from it? Is it really worth it to be Donald Trump or the Pope or, or whoever you care to sort of say is behind everything? Um, I don't think it is. I honestly don't. As I said in a comment to Anti Bullshit Man, I said, I, I honestly believe, and this may be arrogance on my part, but I believe I'm smart enough to be one of the 1%. I believe that I'm clever enough to do what is necessary to make a gazillion dollars and become rich, powerful, famous, whatever. I, take that as you will. I've, al I've always said I'm a very arrogant person, but I believe that I have the capacity to do that. I believe that I have the necessary abilities to do that. I don't want to do it. Why don't I want to do that? Why don't I want to pay the price that's necessary to get all those goodies? Because I don't think that the goodies that they're getting are really all that good. I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's the, the amount of hassle involved to become Donald Trump or to become the Pope or to become a, you know, any sort of captain of society in any way, shape, or form, even being, say, a, a Lady Gaga or, you know, a Justin B, you know, something like this, just a famous person who's rich. I don't think that that's worth it. I really do not. And that's, I think, where conspiracy theories fall down, is the why the conspirators do what they do. When people say that there's this vast conspiracy controlling our society, um, the assumption is that the people at the top who are pulling the strings actually gain something unarguable out of it. Or, as say in the case of anti-Semitism, you say, well, they're just evil and they do that because that's in their nature to do that. It's not, it's not that they're even getting anything out of it, it's just that's what they do. End of story. Um, that's a little bit nastier a conspiracy than I'm interested in debating. But as I say, I put the same thing on Catholic on the Catholic Church, the hierarchy, not not lay Catholics or whatever or rank and file or whatever you want to call them, but the actual people at the top. I'm willing to take them on in that kind of way. Um, but I would say, okay, the, the the people running the Catholic Church aren't really. What are they gaining? They may think that it's fabulous to, to be in the situation that they're in, but at the end of the day, the, the very fact that they have simply stationed themselves at the top of the pyramid means that ultimately they're simply part of the pyramid. They're part of the, the herd, I guess you'd call it. They're, part, they're, they're just the dominant species within the herd. Um, they might see themselves, or others might see them as wolves feeding on the, the herd. I don't even see them 
in that, in those terms because I don't even think that they gain anything out of out of as I say putting society through its through the olive press and squeezing. All that they get is the distilled essence of the garbage that consumer capitalism feeds us, anyways. If you if you don't believe that materialism and 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 consumerism really is of any fundamental value, then what 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 good does it do you to excel at it? Again, you have to sort of say, well, they're just plain evil. That's why. That's the problem with this kind of conspiracy thinking. It always ends up having some something of a scapegoat built right into it. So I don't really think that um, the people who are running society uh, through lies or through manipulation or subterfuge or anything like that, assuming that they are, that this is what's happening, really are getting much of an advantage that's denied the rest of us. They're just getting more of the junk that we get. Uh, they're just getting more of the rubbish that the people at the bottom get. That's all. Their share is bigger, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. So I don't really think that conspiracy theorizing of this kind of uh, of magnitude really explains uh, our civilization fully. And what I said was, I, I believe that it's m merely a distraction, um, and you have to go more fundamental than just getting the goodies, becoming rich, powerful, famous... Uh, lots of luxuries, lots of goodies. Um, I think that in many cases, uh, the people at the top have an extremely negative uh, view of human existence. They say this, this world is a hell, and the only thing that really can be gained out of it are things that are absolutely, unarguably tangible. Quality. Itself. A big house may not mean anything at the end of the day, but it's far better than having a small house. Um, there was this movie that, uh, that I watched a while back, a few years back, about a prisoner of war camp in the south, the southern United States during the Civil War, which was a living hell. And it's kind of a mirror of all prisons in, in all societies, uh, where there was a small clique of people who preyed upon all the other prisoners. And it, it sort of, you ask was it really worth it for these people to be prisoners? It was a, it, It's kind of an infamous vignette in, in American Civil War history, this horrible prison camp that the, the South really didn't mean to do this. It's just the South had other things, i.e. fighting for its survival on its mind. But the main thing, the main point was there was this horrible prison. There was something Auschwitz-like about it. And there was a small number of people who were prisoners in there who were preying on all the other prisoners and who had things like whiskey. They had things like meat. They had things like, uh, they had all these people under their, at their beck and uh, call. And, you know, you sort of think, okay, is it better to be them or is it better to be one of those people who are being preyed upon? Well, the problem is they're all in prison. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be outside of the prison than the, than the most comfortable and the most powerful and the most uh, luxury ridden prisoner in there. I'd rather be out of the jail. That's how I see this whole edifice of conspiratorial explanations of society. I don't see that the people at the top of this heap that we live in really are gaining anything more than just a slightly better than average piece of what ultimately is kind of a miserable pie. Um, at least if we look at it that way, if we look at it in terms of what they get versus what we get, I say you have to look beyond that. Um, people with a negative view of society often rack up a lot more goodies and a lot more, uh, or a negative view, I would say, of human existence often rack up a lot more goodies, a lot more power, a lot more luxury, a lot more uh, fame, etc., than everybody else. But at the end of the day, they're only doing it because of an essentially, fundamentally negative view of human existence. Life is a waste of time. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's a jungle out there. You might as well be a wolf. Um, not that even being a wolf really is of all that use. Um, that's how I see conspiracies. I don't think that, 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 that the Pope really has a particularly enviable um, position in life. I wouldn't even want to be him. In fact, the whole idea turns me off. Not, not simply because I'm disgusted by Catholicism and, and the garbage that it peddles and the, the horrible corruption and all. Just in and of itself, I wouldn't want to be the Pope. <laughs> like it's 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 not worth it for the amount of garbage I would have to do, um, or have to put up with, or or all the the work that would be involved just getting there and maintaining your position. I just I, I couldn't care less. Um, so I, I I don't buy this idea that that there's people who are benefiting from. Um, 
in, in the conspiratorial view of society, I don't believe that there are people up there who are benefiting from it all um, in a way that's any different from the way everybody else is benefiting or not benefiting from human existence. And I see this as sort of a mutually dependent series of scapegoats and conspiracies. The herd requires the wolf in order to make sense out of its own existence because existence itself, per Zapfe and per Plato and per, per the Bhagavad Gita and per a number of other things, can be so confusing and so horrifying and so overwhelming that it can drive you out of your mind. Just existence itself. My previous video was about uh, existential panic. Existential panic itself is... It's the distilled essence of horror in life. And horror at life. Um, no amount of Cadillacs you, or Kim Kardashians on your elbow or, or anything like that is going to change that. You can get everything that you want, but existential panic is waiting, waiting right there for you. Again, Zapfe and Plato. The simile of the cave and the last messiah. Fear at the base of everything. Or fear, among other things, at the base of everything. How do we deal with the horror of existence? Or at least the horror that is at the heart of existence. Or that aspect of the heart of existence that is distilled essence of horror. Well, we scapegoat. We blame somebody else. We can't... Existential panic isn't something that you can actually say is um, caused by this, that, or the other. It's just pure distilled essence of panic at existence itself. But you replace this massive amorphous fear with a fear that you can tack onto somebody else or something else. So let's say I'm using the anti-Semitic metaphor. I can say, life would be good. I'm horrified with my existence, but I wouldn't be horrified if it wasn't for those people over there. And by the same token, this is kind of, as I say, it's almost a symbiosis of horror here. Because, you know, you, you can look at it from the point of view, say, of the Jewish community, who is actually feeling the same existential horror, the same existential panic as everybody else is. But they can say, the herd over there is going to come and kill us all at any given moment. Therefore, our existence, because of that, our existence is one long panic. Um, that kind of thinking is often um, evident in any small minority, and a small minority that tends to be a little bit more affluent than the other, or perceived as a little bit more powerful than the average. Um, it, but again, it's a mutually sort of dependent series of fears. I fear ex existence, therefore I tack my fear onto the Jews. A Jewish person fears his own existence, but he can sublimate that fear into the rational fear of anti-Semitism. So everybody is dodging the question, and they're tacking their fears onto other things. This is what I believe is that ultimately at the bottom of conspiracy theories. Um, it's simply a way of making sense of a completely nebulous and amorphous terror that lies at the center of everything. And again, I, I keep saying this, it lies at the center of everything, yes, but it's not the only thing that lies at the center of everything. There's all kinds of other stuff there as well. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that almost the entire, in my view, the, almost the entire sort of thrust of all, of all philosophies is how do we deal with that horror? How do we deal with suffering, pain, agony, that kind of thing? How do we cope with that? Uh, all philosophy. Or how do we cope with it? How do we end it even, maybe? Um, and again, you're sort of... Uh, you, I, I've dealt with the, the life-denying philosophers and for most of my thinking life, and um, the ones I'm most familiar with are Jainism, and I guess I would now say antinatalism in the Western sense, Western tradition. Um, but I would say even that is kind of a puny kind of point of view, and it's also an interesting point of view in that it pushes things beyond the limits, and this is what fascinated me the most about, say, the antinatalist point of view, is that it pushes things beyond the point of view that most people consider sane. Um, they, you know, most people will hear things like, you know, or read, say, uh, Thomas Ligotti and just go, he's nuts, I don't care, I'm not interested. Well, that's because he's too terrifying and nobody wants to face that horror, okay. But I would say that Thomas Ligotti is sort of missing the mark, and he's basically scapegoating. He's saying existence itself is the problem, and we can somehow end existence. We can't. 
existence is a brute fact. We don't even know what existence is, but it is. Um, so I would say that you have to face that fact. You have to face that horror. Um, and you have to understand that just about anything that we believe is solid and is incontrovertible is ultimately nothing more than a prop. Now, I was talking in the comment section of Anti Bullshit Man's video uh, with Trick. Um, and basically, in my usual irritating way, I was sort of preventing him from taking anything for granted. Anything as a given. Um, I, like, that's, you know, it's just one of the things, one of the tools that I use when I'm trying to explore somebody else's point of view. Never, ever, ever allow people to take anything as given unless they can demonstrate that it is a given. And if they say this is a given and this is incontrovertible, Examine that ruthlessly from every conceivable angle. It's not, I, I'm surprised I don't get called a troll a lot more than I actually do, but I don't believe that that's trolling at all. I believe that that's simple honesty. Uh, you made it, you made a positive statement. I want to examine it. It's as simple as that. And I, at the end of it all, I got Trick sort of going, okay, he's crazy. He's like, whatever, or what did he say? Uh, anyway, which is kind of another way of just going like this. I think that that is a normal human response when you're getting towards the limits of what people are comfortable discussing. You're getting towards the limits of what, where people's sanity can sort of in, can endure, where you're, you're stepping beyond all certainties, all, all the directions of up and down, north, south, whatever, all points of reference are, are being deliberately pushed away. And I think ultimately you you will end up with people either burning you at the stake in one form or another or just going uh, and walking away. I do it all the time. I'm as guilty of this as anybody else. But at the end of the day, <laughs> I find that an insufficient response. Because, you know, again, it's it's like anything else. If you've reached limits, what's beyond the limits? You know, what 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 is what is past this point? There isn't anything past that point, so we won't think about it anymore, is not a sufficient response. So I think if you're going to question things in a fundamental sense, you'd better be prepared to have what you say questioned in a fundamental sense every step of the way. And if you haven't thought that far, that's okay. But what I would say is it's a learning experience if you have to chalk what somebody else up says to sheer insanity. Uh, or just sheer weirdness, or sheer, I don't know, crack pottery, or whatever. Um, I might point out that just about everybody that I know already thinks that my interest in philosophy is already nuts. So it's it's sort of interesting when, you know, as the guy says in Apocalypse Now, what do you, what do, you do when the assassins accuse the assassins? Well, what I say is, what do you do when the nuts accuse the nuts? <laughs> you know, um, are you saying that you're sane? <laughs>